Welcome to Control Your Career, a podcast to help you conquer uncertainty, shatter imposter syndrome, and rise above the expectations imposed by others. My name is Julia Toothaker, and I am the career coach and strategist at Ride the Tide Collective, my career development company where I offer career coaching courses, and I have a plethora of free content. I have been doing this work for over a decade, and I want to help empower professionals like you to find clarity, navigate your current career with finesse, and propel yourself toward career advancement in alignment with your unique personality, preferences, and values. This podcast is a great place to start your journey toward controlling your career. Season 10 is all about managers and specifically what managers want and expect from their employees and teams. I've brought on people managers with at least 10 years of experience managing who are also currently managers to help you understand their mindset and expectations. Each episode will have action items that you can apply to your unique situation and consider in your relationship with your manager. You can find this episode and more at ridethetidecollective.com. And you can connect with me on LinkedIn, where I post career information and inspiration to help you control your career. Welcome, everyone. We are back with another episode. And this season has really been full of people that I know personally, which I really love because I can attest to who they are as humans. And my guest today is even more special to me because I actually worked for her. So I know her management style. My guest today is Jenny Derrick, and she is the Dean of the Farmer School of Business at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And I worked for Jenny a number of years ago. And Jenny, I just have to tell you, I don't know if you know this, but for many years, I had a lot of tumultuous relationships with managers. And before I got to Drucker, which is where we work together, and most of them were women. And we just didn't get along. And I've talked about that throughout the podcast. But I will tell you, when I started working for you, and you inherited me, so it wasn't like I was one of your choices. Mm. But you were one of the best leaders that I had Mm. in my career. And for anybody that knows me, and Jenny knows me, I do not use those words lightly. Mm. It's For me to say that, I mean, you made Mm. a huge impact on me in my career. You helped me realize like my confidence in myself again and how good I was as a professional because I had lost so much of that because of different experiences I had had previously, specifically with women. So I just want to thank you for being a girl's girl. (laughs) I love what I, I hadn't heard you say that. I don't, I didn't know. We'll talk about leadership style as we go through, but you're right to hit one nail on the head that women can be really hard on other women. Mm-hmm. I don't always know why I try and understand that myself, but we'll talk about leadership. But Julie, you, you're just an, an incredible human being yourself. And it's been, I've, I love working with you. And I, you know, I've been a huge fan as you've embarked upon this chapter of your journey. And it's just a joy to be here today and, and talk leadership with you. I couldn't, yes. it's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for being a guest. This really does feel, I think, like a full circle moment because we've both done different things in our career since we've been together and I've seen it just evolve and it's so great that we've been able to stay in contact. It's one of life's privileges. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I would love for you to do an introduction of your career and kind of how you got to this point. Um, Oh, one of the things I did want to mention, because I know not all of our listeners are familiar with higher education and the different levels and what that looks like. Mm. So Jenny, as a dean, effectively works as a CEO. So business schools within larger universities or really any university function as a small corporation um, in terms of everything that it has to do. So you do Mm. have the larger university, but then business schools are an entirely different animal that really will function independently in most places. And the dean serves functionally as a CEO. Mm. So if you're trying to make that equivalent to the corporate side, that's Mm. what it would be. 
Um, so I'd love for you to give an introduction of your history. And something I wanted to note too is because you came up through the faculty side, yeah. that choice to become a, a manager, a people manager within mm. higher education, many faculty don't make that choice, mm. right? They they want to just stay in, do teaching, research, and all of that. So I'm also curious as a, a little mm. add-in bonus, what made you want to make that switch yeah. versus staying exclusively on the faculty track? Yeah, no, that's really good. So so yeah, as a dean, I am a, mini, a CEO of a mini corporation within the larger institution, and that has its own challenges. We may come across those through the interview, right? Uh, but I have 5,000 students. I, I lead a team of 170 faculty and about 60 staff. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty decent sized operation. Mm -hmm. And at Drucker, as as you might know, it was a smaller school. So that's been an interesting leadership transition. But let me give you a very quick potted history of the background I have. So for those listeners who are wondering where I come from, it's not Oxford, Ohio. It's actually New Zealand. So you're listening to a New Zealand accent. And, and I had a couple of buckets. So I worked in corporate New Zealand for fast moving consumer goods and consulting. So I did a bit of that, joined a family supply chain consulting firm and, and helped my father run that business around the time of the Great Recession of 2000, 1998. So that was a period of time. Then I joined the academy and I did that um, to actually leave the family business. And we can delve into family business too, but there may be some listeners that are from family business. Do you stay or do you go? So for me, it was go. So I joined the academy and the one job I want to lean into there that really gave me a taste for leadership was to run the entrepreneurship program at a university in New Zealand. I loved it. I loved creating vision. I love figuring out what to do with a program, a product, how to sell that program to students and how to put the resources in place. Really enjoyed it. I came to the States in 2004, worked for the Drucker School, and the short version of that history, so I was faculty for 12 years. I had mm -hmm. an associate dean's role running the MBA, and that's when Georgia and I, I think, started working closely together around that time. Yeah. But I would sit on the sidelines, and, and I love doing research, don't get me wrong, I love my students as well, but I always knew that I, I could add value to an organisation, and it's easy to sit on the sidelines and have a commentary about what other people are doing in leadership roles. But for me, it was just a no-brainer. I was I was itching to get into a leadership role, to get to the role of deanship. And my time came. It was, I wasn't the most patient person. I had to be a bit patient on that one. <laughs> but the time did come. And, you know, I just love, I love um, feeling like I can make an impact. I love feeling like an, I can influence the direction of where some, somewhere something's going. Mm -hmm. In our world, it's about making a difference in students' lives and the people mm -hmm. then who, who support the students. So that's a, a very uh, a noble mission for me to follow. And then the, the only other part relevant, I think, to this particular question is that I'd been a leader in one context, that's the Drucker School of Management, and I was so grateful for that opportunity and the leadership style that, that um, I developed there, and I'll, I'll speak about that in a minute, but you know, the opportunity to then do something different and test myself out as a leader in a very different context, and that was mm -hmm. what I was looking for, and that's what I got. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, and I, yeah, go. Mm. Well, I was going to say for, for more context for the audience, again, the Drucker School, I would classify as like a startup <laughs> in terms of just how it functioned, how it ran. It was very lean across the board. Yeah. And then where you're at now, much bigger operation. You know, you already said it in terms of staff, faculty, and students. And so that's really that shift from a small, lean team that can be really nimble to, wow, I've got. I have people now. We can do a lot of different a lot more. things. But I, and I, it's a really, and I think about this a lot. I think about where do you thrive, and every context that we find ourselves in, from a career point of view, is different. Mm -hmm. And Drucker, as you've described, Julia, we were scrappy and yes. agile and nimble, and we had to be because we're in a mm -hmm. fiercely competitive market called Southern California. Peter Drucker died in two thousand and five. We had to figure out the brand and what to do with the brand mm -hmm. and how to be relevant. But and we had such a cohesive team that we were just, you know, scrapping and fighting for the good, for the future. Yeah. And we it's not that we don't have that here, if, if anyone's listening from where I currently am at, but we're at capacity as a school. We're full. And and so the challenges are different. And mm -hmm. so for me as a leader, I've spent I spend a lot of time always thinking about how can I improve what I do, how do I lead differently, how do I grow, how do I change? 
And I think leading change management has been the, the box of lessons I've had from here because of the, the, just the different context. Yeah, well, that is a perfect segue into the next question, <laughs> which is how would you describe your overall people management style and then how has that evolved over the years? Yeah, I, I think about this a lot because I think, you know, Drucker was a really interesting place for me to land. And I'll tell you a story I, I love to share. When I told my father, who's 87, he's an engineer, but was an engineer, and I told him I was joining the Drucker School. So this is back in New Zealand. He gave me his entire collection of Drucker books. And he said, I want you to take these. I mean, okay, more, more stuff to ship. But, but, but the point I'm making is that if you truly believed in the value of people and leading through people, you would find the answers to that in Drucker's work. And, and for someone of his generation, he said he was an you know, operations management industrial engineer type person. But, but I remember growing up in a household always about the people. It was always about mm -hmm. how do you have the right teams in place? How do you make sure the right people are in the right job? And Drucker, as you know, you, you, we articulated that well at the Drucker School. It was about treating people with dignity and respect. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's a really important core value that I have. I wake up in the morning. I think at the end of the day, we're all just simply trying to live a good life, a life mm -hmm. of meaning and purpose that looks different to different people. But how do I help that and how do I support that? So I think, you know, one data point too, I think when you come into academic leadership roles, you haven't really worked up through the ranks usually in, in practicing leadership because you've been mm -hmm. like a self-employed entrepreneur with a regular paycheck, you know, right. <laughs> right? turning up to the classes you're scheduled to teach, doing your best that you possibly can, doing research, you're very much a self-starter. So you really, you know, to, to become a leader in higher education, you're not that well prepared for it. So I think you've got to draw on a lot of instinct and, and, and I think have a good EQ for what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think there were some early lessons. So you talk in the question, you talk about evolution and as a leader, and one of our dear colleagues, Andrew, I just met up with him recently, and, and we were laughing about one of the first meetings. He'll, he'll, he'll smile when he hears the story on your podcast, but he'll know the story that I'm about to tell. But I'm always one that's just got so much that we could be doing. You know, there's always so much to do. And, and I learned the cadence of strategy at Drucker, and I, I learned that, that in strategy, we vision, we plan, we implement. But my job as a leader is to spend more time on the visioning, and I've got people to implement. But if I, the second point is our runway is about two to three years from having an idea to getting in a market yes. and to watch my pace. So Andrew walked into my office one day and said, can we just have a conversation about that whiteboard? <laughs> I said, oh, what on earth do you want to talk about and and he said, you know, how do we, you know, and, and the lesson I learned with that, there's always new things to do, but mm -hmm. there's a job to be done, the day job as well. And, and you've got to watch piling things on over the top. I think, um, you know, I've also found as I've become more confident in my own leadership ability is to just step back and let people really shine in the roles they have. Mm -hmm. And I came across something that really caught my imagination, talking about big selves and little selves. And, and a big self was someone who's just simply willing to turn up and, and, and really stay focused on the mission and enable other people to, to perform. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're, when you're a little self, it's about you and proving that you're worthy of the job and making sure people understand you're smart and bright. And, and that's not how I lead. In fact, I know I'm the dean. I know I have to be on the stage with the microphone and, and have the spotlight on me, but I'm far happier when I'm watching other people you know, run their parts of the business as their own. Yes. And I can attest to that because, <laughs> because that's what it was like. You know, it was strategy meetings and then, okay, do the, go do the things, go, go do the things go. that you do, <laughs> go do it. I'm not yeah. going to micromanage you, you know, yeah. but hearing that story about Andrew doesn't surprise me at all because you had me, Andrew, yourself, you have yeah. a group of high achieving, quick moving oh, yeah. people in a culture that really wasn't as quick moving as we wanted it to. Universities, for those listening who do not know higher education, we're not known for being quick. Nope, <laughs> <Right>. nope. <laughs> but I also think that's a good lesson for people mm. listening in terms yeah. of when you're choosing those organizations, if you are somebody that is fast paced and wants to work at a faster pace, you have to be able to ask those questions too yeah. so that you know what you're coming into. I didn't even realize going into higher education how slow it actually was. Oh, it's, it's and bad. it was a deterrent mm, for me, yeah. you know, eventually at the end of my career because 
so much red tape to get the simplest things done. <laughs> and and Drucker didn't have too much red tape. And and I think oh, that's true. <laughs> But I think that's an important point. And, and, you know, one of the other things I've learned as a leader is to be patient and just to be really patient. And I think, you know, you don't have to solve everything the minute that problem comes in through the door. And so the other part of being patient, I've learned to be just to slow it down a little bit. You know, something comes across my desk and I'll, I'll go and fact find a little bit. I mean, I, I am decisive. You know that I will make decisions. We get, th- we get things done. But, but equally, it doesn't have to be, it's not like we're doing open heart surgery and it doesn't have to be done straight away. I think that's an important lesson as well. But I think the other thing too, when you're talking about high achievers and we had a, you know, we, I've always had great teams around me and I, I just, you know, I still keep in touch with the Drucker family. We still, yes. we all keep in touch, but I also have high expectations. So while I don't micromanage, mm-hmm. I, I like to be very, very clear. We 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 are very, very clear about what we're doing, what mm-hmm. needs to be done. I set you free to do it, but you know, woe betide you if if things if you're not on your game. You know? Absolutely, so, right. absolutely. Yeah. Well, and yeah. I think that that worked well for the team yeah. that we had. But I can definitely see how not everybody would warm up to that style yeah. as well. Yeah. But equally, at the same time, I say woe betide you. But I like people to run their part of the business. You you ran our mm-hmm. career strategy center and I like and you ran it as if it was your own business. And when I see that happening, that's a win for me. And and then then we make sure the communication up and down is good. But when people um aren't operating like that I, at, 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 and we, especially when they're employed at a level that's an expectation of the job then, then we have a problem yeah yeah all right I would love to talk about the hiring process and what you go through yeah. <laughs> and I think there there's an interesting juxtaposition here because you hire faculty and you also hire staff mm. and those hiring processes and what you're looking for do tend Very different. to yeah. be different So let's start with some of the basics in terms of the resume and the interview process. Mm -hmm. What are you looking for? What are you hoping that candidates are going to come across with? And I'll I'll focus my answers more on staff because faculty, the departments, faculty departments really hire their own faculty and then they make a recommendation to the dean. So I won't cover that so much. But I think, you know, when we put CVs in, and you and I have talked about CV and CV structure in different contexts, and I think mm-hmm. it's it's been a moving target. I like a good cover letter and and, and one that's that looks as if they've, they can line up to the job. I think that to me is important. And we do read them, but we're not a brand that will get thousands of applications either. So right. it's a bit different. <laughs> um, but I also, you know, I like I like to see results. And I'll focus, my comments are more at sort of mid to senior level, a little mm-hmm. bit more. Um, yeah, but but I, even below that, I like to see the, a sense of initiative because of the way I like to lead. I like to know that people are just going to own what they have to do. So results to me are important. But I'm really looking for someone who I think is going to really care about adding value to the organization and and wants to be part of that culture where we're always looking to improve ourselves and be better versions of ourselves. And that's Mm -hmm. not always obvious from CVs or letters. And so one of the things I do try and do which sometimes might violate policy. I'm not really sure. <laughs> well, it's not quite in line with, but it doesn't violate it, but it's not it's not the recommended policy. But I've learned now, to, I'd rather have a, a bigger number of smaller uh, initial calls with a bigger pool of candidates. Just, mm. and, and even if it's a 15 or 20 minute call, to, to just give people a chance to tell their story because it's it's it's, it's that to me, it, it's hard to pick that up from, from paper sometimes. So I'd I'd rather go a little longer on the first round and put more people in it and spend more time Mm. doing it and just get a better sense of of the people I'm working with and how I think they're going to operate than I would um, not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I want to point out a couple of things because I think it's interesting when we hear the different strategies and ways that people hire. And so in this conversation, we're talking about cover letters, which has been such a controversial Mm. topic whenever I bring somebody on, because there are a lot of industries that are trying to do away with cover letters. And I can tell you, education is not one of them. So if you are somebody that's applying into education, whether you've come up that way, or maybe you've been in corporate and you want to work at a university or something like that, cover letters are still very much a core part Mm -hmm. of the hiring process. 
People read them. They're looking for not only how you articulate yourself from a written standpoint, True. but they are, I think, looking for a little bit more of that story and the personal side. Because yeah. anyone in higher education, it really becomes about the students and the student impact. And so most people who are in higher education, they're looking for staff to reflect that yeah, as well. Is that... It's fair. So when you look at, um, and I'm not saying this for, for many staff positions, but at, at the top of the house, the deans and provosts and presidents, there's an expectation that people write really long cover letters. And I'm not advocating for that, but a cover letter that's closely lining up between all of the bullet points about what they're looking for is required. So I would, I, you know, a cover letter to me would be one or two pages, but exactly what you're saying, Julia, it's about. How can I be confident that this person can add value in this kind of context? Mm -hmm. And I think you make another important point that there's an expectation that people can communicate ex effectively, especially at the top of the of the um, the house within within the school. Absolutely. I want to point out something else to um, staff resumes in higher education are not faculty resumes. So staff resumes are going to look more traditional in terms yeah. of the structure of them. So if you think about any advice you get for corporate resumes, very similar. I would say the difference would be um, any extra certifications that you have or uh, group um, it, committees that you've been on. Yeah. If you've been published, a lot of staff have done different writing and things like that. You would add those types of things in. Um, but a faculty resume is a whole other <laughs> beast. We're not even going to touch on that, <laughs> but yeah. it's wildly different. And so I, I just want to let people know um, when we're talking about CV in this context, it's going to look more traditional. Yeah, and just one slight clarification on that for those who might be listening from outside of the US, and I know you've got a really big um, yes. following, <laughs> and, 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 and the New Zealand context, which is very much the Commonwealth context, they do call staff all people. And so that could be a bit confusing if if you're if someone might be looking to relocate to another country. Yes, they they will put them in together. But to your point, Julia, you know, a staff CV, a resume, should look very similar to what it would in any industry. Is mm -hmm. I think the cover letter just sets it apart. And 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 it's like anything you you're wanting people who you know, we're running a business at the end of the day. So you're wanting mm -hmm. people who can talk about I've done this and this led to this outcome. Very much right. the way you, you train. Yeah. Right. Right. And then something else I want to point out with interviews because again I don't know who's going to be listening to this. So I figure let's let's resource as much mm -hmm. as we can. But when you're applying for staff positions, especially student facing or faculty facing, you have to, I think, treat that interview like a presentation to an extent in terms of the person on the other end, in my experience, is going to be evaluating how you are articulating mm. yourself and your thoughts and your ideas. Because in most cases, if you have to be put in front of faculty, yeah. <laughs> they will tear you apart if you they cannot, can. you know, get to their level, if you are not sharing information quickly, succinctly, all of that. So these are some things that I think you need to think yeah. about when you're applying within okay. an educational context. And I'll, I'll add one thing to that, and then I'll add one more thing. I'll add the one more thing first. A lot of, don't be put off, listeners who are, who are not used <laughs> to higher education, you could have a half-day interview for a staff position and it could have multiple panels of people mm -hmm. and some of the panels could be 10 people deep or bigger and that's just the way we do things. And partly we do things that way because we don't always differentiate procedures and policies between how we might hire a dean versus how we might hire an admin. Absolutely. We just do the same kind of thing. And I think your point's really well made about having a vision because – Again, we're conditioned to hear people articulate their vision for their role, especially at the top of the mm -hmm. house, or even a faculty member, mm -hmm. when they come and give their job talk, they're talking about their research portfolio and their vision for how that's going to continue. So I think when you apply for these jobs, to pick yourself in the job and think about how mm -hmm. you're going to add value. And people aren't going to judge you harshly on the basis that you you may not quite get it right. You don't know what the inside secrets are. But I think to your point, you've got to be willing to have that conversation. Yes, yes, absolutely. Hey there, Julia here. Is this episode resonating with you? Maybe it's got you questioning how you can better communicate with your manager, team, or just learn more about how to control your career. Well, I've busted into this episode to tell you about my career action coaching. 
Career coaching is more than job search and resumes. It's also about managing the day-to-day -day situations that come up in your career. This coaching option is perfect for the career management situations that you're dealing with, along with other career-related challenges or goals. This is a flexible coaching option to help tackle specific topics to move forward efficiently and confidently. Not all coaching requires a six-month commitment. Career Action Coaching is three hour-long sessions that can be customized to your unique needs. Before committing, let's discuss what you need in my complimentary Career Coaching Clarity Call. The link will be in the show notes and the description for this episode. Now let's get back to the show. I'm going to skip past one of the questions, which is the similar candidates question, um, because I want to get into some other pieces a little bit more deeply. So I would love to know, what do one-on-ones mm. look like for you? How do you conduct them? What are the expectations yeah. there? So what I, I have one-on-ones with my direct reports and one other person that's running a key part of the business every week. I schedule them every week. We schedule them for half an hour because they're every week. And on the basis that if I'm traveling and that happens, if we get two or three a month, we've had a good month. So that's the expectation. The person coming into that meeting has to write an agenda. They have to give me that agenda 24 hours before, and that doesn't mm. always happen. <laughs> Let me be clear. <laughs> so, so, and if there's anything I'm meant to read in advance, although that's not normally the way the meetings go, but very, very, mm. it's very much them reporting up and letting me know what they're working on. And for me to know, to be able to connect the dots across the organization and to be able to know, you know, often like, how can I help you? What can I do to support you? Mm -hmm. If they need me to get on the phone or email and talk to someone somewhere in the university where I can exert influence and help, then I will. So that's what we do. And that's a big part of how we roll. And we also have a couple of other meetings. So before I go on, people who don't report directly to me, I often schedule monthlies with them. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm very particular to make sure that their direct report doesn't feel I'm going around them. It's, it's an operating principle that I really am, am firm on for me up and down, up the house, but also mm -hmm. people who are below me. So it depends on the person and how long they've been there and whether the direct report's welcome to come to those meetings. That's fine. There's no, nothing secretive about it. But equally, if there are things that come up that I feel the direct report needs to know, that's sort of an understanding in those meetings as well. So that's how I operate is, is very much... Um, and and that we go quickly and you know that so, so sometimes we we don't have to meet the whole half hour but it's I just find those face to face meetings a really good way to keep in touch. But what's interesting when I when I was pausing saying the half an hour, I don't know if you remember some of the best meetings we ever had was where we gave ourselves an hour. Yes, you know, and I say <laughs> I say that because the first half hour you kind of. You know, we get through what has to be talked about, but it's that second half hour where sometimes we really get through some meaningful strategy and sort of mm -hmm. solving problems. So, so sometimes we'll add time. Uh, I, I like the I like the idea that people can try and figure things out for themselves and not feel highly dependent. I think that that's an important um, way of operating, and so mm -hmm. that looks differently different times. If someone's new, they might need to pop in and out more often. But my assistant right now, she she's got a, a system working right now. She'll bundle up a few things and she'll just come in for fifteen minute touch bases when she needs a bit of help. So there's a fine line because you don't want them to become dependent on you and mm -hmm. and learning and thinking for yourself is, is is a good good thing. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. And I want to make a distinction here because I think most of my guests up to this point have been more what I would consider middle management, right? So they're really, um, they're bringing agendas to their people as much as their people are bringing agendas mm -hmm. to them. And it's, um, I think, much more top down in terms of how they're conducting one-on-ones and things like that in some cases. But I want to reiterate, the dean position functions like a CEO. So when you're reporting up to somebody who's at the head of the organization, mm -hmm you're not going to make the agenda, right? Unless there is something that needs to be talked about. And having worked for you, I'm pretty good at knowing too, you will usually ping us <laughs> if oh, something yeah, needs to be talked about. 
Um, yeah, so you that's let us truth. know. But mm-hmm. this isn't uncommon, right? So yeah. you have your VPs, your senior leaders who really do set the agenda for their one-on-ones because they are all leading. They're and so a lot of those, right. yeah, yeah, it's a lot of strategy conversation yeah. and how, you know, what's the pulse of everything. And when you're talking about students, if it's a student facing department, you also have to talk, have those conversations yeah. because there are a lot of things that can be happening. You know, we have different crises that happen on campus that need to be addressed and things like that. So yeah. I want to make that distinction because I think what you've said is slightly different from what we've heard from other and, people. And it's it's so. really interesting because you, you're right. You've got to trust your people. You've got to also trust them to know when they need to tell you something's going mm-hmm. on. And to your point, I'm always available. You know that. And and um, text messages, you know, late night phone calls. because And you know, I mean, people are in the roles that report to me are generally experienced enough and self-aware mm-hmm. enough to know when they need to go up. But I want to extend what I just said too because to me – where I spend a lot of time in my head is about how do I get everything aligned? How do I have strategic mm-hmm. alignment up and down the organization? And that's people communicating up to me, but me making sure I communicate messages down right. and, and making sure we're all aligned and we're staying focused on priorities in, in the right way, in a healthy way. I'm not saying mm-hmm. in, a, in a manic way, but I think it's no organization will generally, very few of that well resourced that they've got slack in the system. Mm-hmm, and and mm-hmm. just to stay really, you know, focused on the things that are going to move the needle, the things that are important, and make sure we keep the communication flow around. That, that yeah. that's where I spend a lot of time. Just always fine tuning. Yeah. Yes, and I think it's one of the things that makes you a really good leader is you have such a good big picture look at your organization. But you can drill down into it if you need to ask questions. I, t- I always joke. You don't want to. You don't want me to keep a shadow list on you. If I have to keep a shadow list on you, then we've got a problem. Because what that means is that I'm not confident in you following mm-hmm. through on the things you promised to follow through on. Now that doesn't mean that I hold you so accountable to the things you've agreed to do that. You know, equally, you could come to my office as as you have done, and others, many others have, and say, look. I need to pause on this project for a while and 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 you know we'll have that conversation. It's fine. So but you know, so it's about keeping that cadence going, I think is 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 what I do spend a lot of time on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this is a good segue into the next conversation. Jenny, you're making this so easy for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about PIPs or performance improvement plans. And I will be honest, in my time in higher education, I have rarely seen this formally happen um, unless something really egregious Mm -hmm. has happened or a student has complained about something or or what so I would love to get your perspective on this and your experience with it I think it's you're absolutely right we're not good at putting performance improvement plans in place and I don't think we're actually as good as we should be in performance reviews and and Mm -hmm. um Look into the future. And I think that was something Drucker taught us, Drucker principles taught us is that job descriptions aren't always helpful, but I'll but I'll come back to that because they actually <laughs> you know, to, to really focus on what value did you add last year and how are we going to have add value in the next year. And so try and stay focused on that. Mm-hmm. But we have, you know, I, I've probably one of the things I should have added in the first question you asked me about how I've grown as a leader. I have grown with respect to, to giving and receiving feedback, mm-hmm. to knowing when to, to provide feedback on performance so you don't end up with a performance improvement plan. Right. Also knowing if you end up with a performance improvement plan, especially, I don't know, different contexts apart from this context, and you say fix these three things, the person might fix those three things and then there'll be another three things. So it, it can go on and on and on and on. So it's not always that helpful. So, so, but we do do, you know, we certainly do use them as a tool. But, you know, one of the things I've learned, again, you know me, I go, I, I'm not always the best person on policies. <laughs> so I'm slowing down enough to, to do that. But, but one Is thing anyone have, in higher education really good at following yeah. any policies? <laughs> oh, no, we have people who do that. But, <laughs> but I think that the point I'd like to make is that when you look at, um, you know, setting performance, well, job descriptions is what I'm saying. One thing I learned the hard way is that oftentimes people evolve, their jobs evolve as they grow, mm-hmm. and we don't always keep the job description up to date. And I've I've fallen on on a, on a few problems by not doing that when the universities can do things like centralised 
functions as, as corporate mm-hmm. does. Mm-hmm. But if I don't have my job descriptions up to date enough, I've had some problems when positions have been moved around because people aren't fully aware of what the person is doing. So, so I think it's really important to stay a little current with job descriptions. But more importantly to me, it's when, it, when it comes to performance, it's about how did you add value? Last, what was your contribution? last year and what's your contribution going to be this year and let's focus on those things and be really clear about goals and setting goals because I've also learned that that's not doesn't come easy to some people yes yes and this actually leads really wonderfully into my next question <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> well so you know we talked a, a little bit before about your cut you're in that CEO level position so your role is very different and again for those who don't understand a dean role at a business school specifically a lot of it is running the strategy and running the school but it is also being very visible out in the world so yeah. you aren't there a lot of the times yeah. mm. uh, because you're doing that in terms of fundraising and just a general visibility yeah. um, um, and so when we think about that, how do you keep your employees growing, right? When you yeah. know that they're really bringing a lot more to you, what, do, what does you imparting growth and making yeah. sure that they're growing within their positions looks like? It's such a good question. It's, some, it's something I think of a lot. So you remember one of the things I used to say at Drucker's, swim in your lane and don't <laughs> do not dive bomb into someone else's lane. I used to tell someone that quite a lot. <laughs> not you. Um, but <laughs> but, it's, but it's, it's a really interesting thought because you want people to grow. But I've also come to think that, that in the first instance, the person who wants to grow, they should firstly say, am I doing the best possible job I I can possibly be doing in the job I'm hired to do. And I, to me, that's so important. And it's important for us as leaders to notice that and to recognize the, the value that people will bring to their job. And I say that because it's very easy when you're swimming in your lane to go, oh, that's interesting. I would be mm-hmm. stimulated if I could get involved in that project. I need to listen to that because I don't want to shut that down. I know mm-hmm. people who get really frustrated when they see that they want to grow professionally but at the same time what I find really difficult to tolerate is when people are jumping in and out of other people's lanes having opinions trying to contribute and that can just derail the person who's in the job they're there to do mm-hmm. and set my second point is I am the dean and and it's not it's not someone else's job I'm the dean <laughs> let me be clear <laughs> so, so so even though you might look at my me doing my job and I think because I've been deaning if that's a word for about eight years nearly a decade I, I make it look easy because I've been doing it for a while I know what the job requires and of course there's always you know pressure points and so forth that's that's true but it's easy to make it look easy and for other people to think that they too could be doing your job well they're not they're employed to do their job Um, And equally, at the same time, I'm also really particular about not not being an armchair critic. And by that, I mean, I mean, it's easy for me to look at the top of the house. So for me, I report to a provost that's like a chief operating officer. That Mm -hmm. person reports up to the president. There's a board of trustees above that, like a board of directors, very similar. But but it's I don't do the jobs above me. And so I'm I, I try and check myself at the door a little bit because it's very easy to to say, well, if I was the pro if I was the pre- and I'm not. <laughs> so, right. so my job is to do the best possible job I can as a dean. And through that, I'm adding value to the school and indirectly I'm therefore adding value to the organization. Mm-hmm. And that's important to me. But having said that, as I say, I think people need to know that they are supported in terms of growth. And as part of the, not just an annual discussion, but if there are things that come up through the year that people are interested in, I, I will absolutely entertain that discussion. Mm-hmm. I also am a huge fan of, of, of professional development. And I think it's yeah. really, right, it's really easy and, and just to get stuck in your little bubble and not not pop up out of that bubble and see what's going on in the world. And so I, I fully support faculty and staff who want to go off and, and do things that might grow them. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, I have to touch on something that you just talked about, which is, is you have people above you. And this is something that I think everybody needs to be aware of, whether you're in higher education or, you know, you're an IC working, you know, reporting to a people manager, whatever that looks like. There's always somebody else. There is always somebody else above whoever you are reporting to. And in your context, yes, we're talking about a dean as a CEO level, and you're essentially running a small corporation. 
but that's a small corporation within a larger context. Yeah. So there are people above you and there are other, you know, obstacles, challenges, opportunities. There are other things that have to be taken into consideration mm. within the larger system. And I think a lot of corporations, you understand that as well because you have different, you know, different arms and different areas mm. if you're, you know, multinational, um, exactly. international mm. companies, all of that. Same idea. And I, I really want to impart kind of to the average worker that's listening mm-hmm. to this, the average employee that's listening to this. There are always going to be pressures yeah. coming from the top that you have no idea that's about true. because your manager is trying to shield that from you because it's not something that you need to worry about. And higher education, because I've experienced it, is one of those areas where you will never know everything that is going on if you're at a certain level. And it is, it is easy to critique, you know, the leadership style and the decisions and the choices and all of that. But you have to understand there is always somebody else. If it's not a provost or a president, it's a board or it's the students. Right, our customers. So, that's right. And and we've got mm-hmm. universities are really odd places for people who don't work in them. They're a very unusual context. But we, you know, we have faculty governance, so I can't I can't affect change if I don't have the faculty behind me. Absolutely, right. and, and that's important. But to your point, I and mean, we're part of a system, and I think many organisations are part of some kind of system, however mm-hmm. defined. I've got other deans who run schools alongside me. Mm-hmm. I've got people above me. I've got the board, and and you know, you want to be fiercely determined about what you're trying to do for the school and have a really strong sense of vision as as to where you're heading but you've got to be willing to play well with others because we're part Mm -hmm. of a system I'm not I'm not the president of an island right (laughs) (laughs) well and I think higher education is one of the few areas where you have former students who have gone through the program they're alumni now who want a say in what is happening and where things are going. Whereas when you're in a traditional corporate environment, once somebody leaves that environment, they're out. You're not going to hear from them anymore. It's so true. I'm glad that you you recognize that, Julia, because because both places I've been dean have got incredibly loyal and engaged alumni. I mean, the Drucker alumni were fantastic. Amazing. Exactly. And many of them were taught by Peter Drucker. So they really were, um, we used to call them uh, devotees, you know, disciples. Mm -hmm. And, and 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 then I've got a completely different thing going on here, but incredibly committed alumni who care deeply about the school. And they're mm-hmm. watching you and they want to make sure that you maintain the value and the integrity of the degree that they've earned, that you're not yes. messing it up, right? Absolutely. And so I do get people call me quite frequently and 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 with a lot of opinions about what I should be doing. And and but that goes from the territory. You've got, you know, the students are customers, they 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 pay a lot of money for higher education. Mm-hmm. We have faculty governance, as I said, without faculty supporting what we do, we can't affect change. So in this role, it's a CEO role, but it's a really unusual role because you've got so many competing forces who all have quite strong opinions that you do have to take into consideration, but ultimately you've got to make decisions and move forward. Right, right. All right. I I always love to end with action because that is something that I like to provide value to for my audience. So I would love for you to share if you could give current employees any advice to be successful in their positions and with their manager, what would that be? I think I'm channeling Peter Drucker right now as as we talk. You know, Peter Drucker always talked about what is your contribution and always think about, you know, at the end of the day, what is it that you yourself are contributing to the organization of what's your part and how can you show up and perhaps contribute more and differently within the within the role that you've been hired to do. And and that would be my my A. And then related to that would be to the growth question, is there any other way that you can provide additional value? But always focus on what your contribution is. Yes, I love that. Jenny, thank you so much for being a guest. This was such a wonderful conversation. And I'm so glad we've been able to provide some context and a look into higher education versus the corporate world. I think that'll be helpful for some people out there that might be considering either from either side. (laughs) Yeah. Well, thank you. It's just it's so good. I, I love you, Julia. And you know that we touch base from time to time over different things. I love what you're doing. I love the way your career is evolving. And I really, 
more than anything, I just love how much you're giving back to people and the community at large that, through the work you're doing. And we all know, as Drucker said, that that we're at work a lot of our day, and and work does provide meaning and purpose. And 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 you you do so much good work to help people to allow people to get that meaning and purpose from their lives through work and other things. So thank you so much for what oh, you're doing. I appreciate thank you, you so much. Oh, I appreciate that. I did not tell her to say that either. <laughs> that was an ad for well, We've got this mutual admiration <laughs> society going on. That's true. That's true. And there's, there's a, a lot of love in this episode. <laughs> All right, there is. But there is. So thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time.